So the next talk is by the same authors, uh, but this one time it will be presented by uh, Mark, Mark Howard, and it's application of a resource theory for magic states uh, to fault-tolerant quantum computation. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, this is work with Earl, who you might remember from 60 seconds ago. Um, so we're going to apply a resource theory to this setting of uh, fault-tolerant quantum computation. So I'll spend a couple of slides just on uh, motivating and giving some background. So the cartoon picture of how we're going to build a quantum computer is we're going to use an error-correcting code, which is going to take some data, use some encoding circuit to spread it out over multiple physical qubits. Then we're going to operate on our data and maybe suffer some noise. We're going to perform measurements, and they're going to maybe uh, inform our decision on some correction operation that we do. And then at the end of the day, we've applied some logical unitary to our encrypted or our encoded data. So that's the plan. Um, stabilizer codes are the family of codes that we understand the best. And naturally associated with them are the Clifford group. So we've already seen that twice today. So the Clifford group is generated by C0, Hadamard, and S, which is the square root of the Z rotation about the, the Z axis. Or I like to think of it as the group generated by the C0 and the set of rotations that map the octahedron inside the uh, block sphere onto itself. So the uh, encoding circuit is typically Clifford. That's fine, but a lot of times what you find is that the gates that you can do, the logical gates that you can do in a fault-tolerant way are also Clifford. And uh, that's not great news. So the more precise statement is that you can't get a transversal and universal set of gates um, within, a, within an error correcting code, and so um, you have to come up with some other idea. And you know we have in mind, as in Earl's talk, the, the Toric code or something like that. So how are we going to get around that? We're going to just add to the gates that we can do. We're going to add a supply of magic states. So what is a magic state? It's a state that enables a non-Clifford gate. So T state, as we saw in the last talk. So here's what it looks like geometrically on the left. So as I said before, we have the octahedron inside the block sphere. That's uh, this object with six vertices. So I think of poly x, y, and z. You have three poly operators. Each of them has two eigenstates. So that forms six uh, pure states on the, point of the, on the surface of the block sphere. And then if you join them together, that makes an octahedron. So the T state is obviously has to be outside this octahedron. It's not a stabilizer state. And it lies somewhere between the, the X eigenstate and Y eigenstate. So what's good about the T state is that uh, we can just take a copy of it, form this different circuit, and then that gives us effectively the T gate, which we want. So just to reiterate, yeah, if we have the Clifford group, which is this bit here, you don't get universal quantum computing, but you have, you have the Clifford group, and then you add in this T gate, you do get a universal quantum computing uh, capability. So how do you actually get access to these T states? Well, you can't just create them perfectly straight off the bat. So best you can hope to do is create bad versions of them, and then iteratively uh, improve those until they get pure and pure. So in circuit form, what you do is you take in um, multiple copies of a noisy T state, perform some measurements, and then as Earl said, if you get the wrong answer, just throw it away. If you get the right answer, you have an encoded version of your T state that you want, and then so you just unencode, and now you have your T state. So you might have to do this multiple times. And so this is the circuit picture, and what you should have in your mind is that this really tedious process the meat grinder where you put in you know, lots of bad stuff at the top and you crank the handle for a long time and eventually get out some nice shiny thing at the end. And you want to you know, avoid doing that as much as, as much as possible. So the overhead associated with magic state distillation is actually polynomial in the number of T gates. So it's efficient in the computer science sense. But when you actually run the numbers, they're kind of eye-watering. So, Logical Cliffords account for about 2 to 10%. And the logical non-Cliffords, if you include this machinery associated with magic state distillation, can account for over 90%. So 
I think there's a lot of interesting work to be done in this middle ground between, okay, people in labs building high quality qubits, people in ivory towers inventing quantum algorithms. And then in between here, we're trying to, um, you know, connect all these qubits up to make a useful device. And we want to do it uh, in a way that doesn't use billions of qubits if possible. We can maybe try and get that down to by a couple of orders of magnitude just by having some uh, good ideas. So just the last comment, just to reiterate that it se might seem kind of weird when you first see it that you can do these z-axis rotations. You can do the z rotation and the s rotation, which is just uh, kind of a quarter of the way around the block sphere. You can do that easily. But the t-gate, which is just a 1 8 rotation around the z-axis, is hard. And you say, OK, why don't you just leave your laser on for half as long? But it's because you're working at the encoded level. Okay, so that's why you have these extra restrictions that make the T-gates harder. Okay, so now we have this natural partition into easy and hard stuff. So in our case, the easy stuff is going to be the stabilizer slash Clifford stuff. The hard stuff is going to be the T-gates and the associated things. So this suggests uh, looking, at, looking at this in terms of resource theory. So resource theories have been very successful in quantum information theory. and um, cartoon picture is that you have some set of free states or cheap stuff and then outside of that you have the expensive stuff and so if I take some one expensive thing how do I quantify how expensive it is well robustness is a very good um, quantifier so the idea is that you decompose your expensive thing in terms of the free stuff so um, there's going to be some uh, free state far away from our expensive state and as I mix the free thing with the expensive thing, the expensive thing gets pushed further and further, and eventually it gets into the region of free stuff. And so this is essentially captured by robustness, which I have here. So that uh, captures the amount of mixing that's required. So obviously there are different decompositions that you could pick, and so this is kind of the minimum overall possible decompositions. So as I said, that's the kind of generic thing, and robustness appears in you know, entanglement and all sorts of other resource theories. Um, so in our case, it's going to be the free stuff is going to be stabilizer stuff, and the expensive stuff is going to be non-stabilizer stuff. And then the uh, region of free stuff is going to be the stabilizer polytope, so the generalization of the octahedron that I showed before. So you want to have your quantifier to obey certain reasonable things to be useful. And uh, we've shown it for this stabilizer resource theory. Other people have shown it for the other ones. Um, so what you want, something like faithfulness, so that uh, the robustness of a state inside this free region is 1, and everything outside it has robustness greater than 1. It also obeys submultiplicativity. So if you take two copies of a state and look at the robustness, that's going to be less than or equal to the robustness of that state squared. And then it's a uh, non-increasing under stabilizer operation, so it's uh, monotonic. So overall, that's a well-behaved quantifier. Uh, some people would prefer that you could just take the log of this quantity that we've defined, and then you'd find that the, the kind of baseline level is zero, and submultiplicativity becomes subadditivity. That's just personal preference. OK, so now we had the cartoon kind of geometric picture. How do you actually calculate robustness if I, if, uh, you give me a state, how do I calculate the, the number associated with the robustness? So you recast it as a linear program, which looks like this. So the, the problem statement is I have some matrix A and some matrix B, and I'm trying to find the best vector x. So matrix A is going to describe the vertices of this region of free states. Matrix, uh, vector B is going to be a representation of my uh, resource state. And x is some decomposition of the vertices of the free thing, um, which gives me b. But this, this problem, as it's stated here, is underdetermined. So there are lots of different x's which will satisfy this equation. So I want to find the one that has minimum L1 norm. Okay. So a concrete example is going back to this just a single t state for a single qubit. The uh, A matrix has got six columns because there are six stabilizer states on, on the vertices of this octahedron. So the zero state is just this column here, which has got uh, one expectation value for sigma z and so on. My uh, T state here is going to have a B vector that looks like this. So it's got one over root two 
sigma x coefficient, 1 over root 2 sigma y coefficient, and 0 sigma z coefficient. And then I just plug it into my solver, and I find that the, uh, the optimum solution is this. So the thing, the minimum uh, L1 norm x satisfying this uh, is, is, gives me a robustness of root 2. And this is the actual vector, what it looks like. So if you can read off, it actually makes some of this, this, and this in the right proportions, and you get a t state. Okay. And, I've, and this one here has a negative coefficient, right? Otherwise, if these were all positive, it would be a probability distribution, and it would be inside the octahedron. OK, so a nice thing about linear programs is that while you're solving this kind of minimization, you're also solving another problem at the same time, which is the dual uh, problem. So effectively, I'm uh, maximizing the expectation value with respect to some kind of uh, witness operator. And um, you know, when I eventually achieve the minimum uh, of my original problem, then the dual problem, uh, the solution of that is giving me a hyperplane, which is a witness that's tied against the set of stabilizer states. And so when I get the expectation value of my state rho with respect to this witness, that gives me exactly the robustness. So that's also a useful feature. So linear programs, they're actually very efficient to solve. So that's great. Uh, in practice, it's very easy to do. You just use CVX with MATLAB, and then this is literally one line of syntax will solve the problem for you. That's fine. The only downside is that the problem statement um, grows super exponentially because the number of stabilizer states grows super exponentially in the number of qubits. So for a single qubit, we had six vertices. For two qubits, we have 60 vertices. And then by the time we got up to five, there's two and a half million columns in our A matrix. So that's where we stopped. So now that I've set up the uh, robustness framework, I'm going to say how we applied it in three different scenarios. So the first one is simulation of quantum circuits. So I'm going to think of a circuit composed of Clifford gates and T gates, which, uh, as we heard in the last talk, is a universal quantum computer. So it shouldn't, be, shouldn't expect an efficient simulation scheme. Otherwise, we're all out of a job. But our result is that robustness gives you an exponential simulation protocol with a fairly OK exponent. And this you know, scheme works for any third level hierarchy uh, type gate, as we saw in the last talk. You can also apply this robustness uh, to get lower bounds on the number of T gates for um, synthesizing certain circuits. And we also found some new, or at least to us, kind of circuit identities that were kind of surprising. OK, so the first application is simulation. So basic idea is that you take a quantum circuit with tau of these T gates. And every time you see a T gate, you just replace it with this gadget. Now we have a Clifford circuit, a purely Clifford circuit, but some of the inputs are magic states. So we're going to adapt the existing schemes so that they can also work on inputs that are just not stabilizer states. So there's going to be some magic states as input as well. So unfortunately, this is the third kind of definition of robustness, but they're all the same. And it's kind of useful to jump between the different ones. Robustness is actually a quasi-probability distribution over stabilizer states. So what that means is that uh, these uh, xi weightings times the, uh, each stabilizer state, um, that gives you, you can decompose our, our state row in terms of these uh, stabilizer states and weightings xi. And these xi are going to sum to 1. So that's, that's the bit that's like a probability. But the fact that they can be negative means they're quasi-probabilities. So in our simulation scheme, what we do is we take that quasi-probability representation, and we just turn it into a proper probability. So you just uh, take the absolute value and then normalize. OK, so now it's a proper probability distribution. And we can use uh, chernoff hufting type um, arguments to say that we can uh, simulate the circuit. And uh, it requires uh, this many samples to get delta close to the real distribution of probability 1 minus epsilon. So what's interesting here is that in our uh, sample complexity, we see this quantity here coming up, which is exactly what we get from robustness. So the claim would be that robustness has an operational meaning as the classical simulation overhead. 
And so going back to the original question, if I have a circuit with tau of these t-type magic states, we get a simulation that scales as 1.685 to the power of tau, to the power of, so the number of t states that we have. And that uh, compares quite well with the result from, I think, last year's QIP, Bravi, Smith, and Smolin, where their um, simulation scheme based on stabilizer Schmidt rank had uh, an exponent 1.919 1 1 to the power of tau. So where did I get this 1.685 number? So we had that uh, circuit using n copies of a resource state row has simulation cost that goes as so. So how do we simulate a circuit with tau of these t ancillas? Well, the obvious thing to do is just you know uh, use the you know just use exactly this. So it would be two to the tau scaling. But the sub multiplicative sub multiplicativity that I uh, mentioned on the resource desiderata list uh, that actually is helpful here. So if instead we take chunks of t state, then we see that if we take two copies and we take the square root, then we get a better scaling, 1.748. If we take three copies and we take the third root, then we get a better scaling again, and so on. So again, our numerics, we could go as far as five, so that's where we got this 1.685 number. In principle, you could keep going and going and going, and then where does this finally end? So the limit, as n goes to infinity, so this would be the regularized robustness of uh, the nth root of n fold copies of this t state is in this uh, interval between 1.457 to the tau and 1.685 to the tau. So this is just the, the five um, t state number that I was able to calculate explicitly. This lower bound comes from a theorem that we have in the paper that the regularized robustness is lower bounded. So if you have a state with block vectors or x or y or z, then we have a lower bound in terms of those things. So if you just plug in 1 over root 2 for x and y here, you get that 1.457 number. OK, so that was the simulation part. Now we're going to talk about how can we use this robustness to uh, lower bound the number of T gates for some synthesis. So we are going to have some circuit. It won't be Clifford plus T in general. Maybe, maybe it's got some uh, control S gates in it. So we know already that there does exist some um, decomposition of control S into Clifford plus T, and this is what it looks like. But is this a good synthesis or not? So the basic idea that we can use is, OK, we can take our gadget. Every time we see a T gate, just replace it with this little gadget thing. And then because control S is from the third level of the hierarchy, this also has a, an associated resource state or magic state, which is just what you get by applying control S to a plus state. And now we're going to compare the robustness of this to the robustness of these three T gates. And because robustness is well behaved and it's not increasing under stabilizer operations and so on, we can see if we've kind of wasted any of our T magic in making this control S state. So it turns out when you run the numbers that this synthesis is actually really good. So uh, the robustness of control S state lies in between two copies and three copies of the T state. And in fact, it's actually 2.2, which is very close to the robustness of three T states. So this is actually a very efficient use of magic, being parsimonious with our use of T states. OK, so then let's look at another example, Toffley. It's known for uh, a few years now that the best possible unitary synthesis of the Toffley gate using Clifford plus T requires seven T gates. So you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that's provably optimal. But then Cody Jones comes along and he says, OK, if, I, if you just allow me to use a couple of ancillas and do some measurements, then I can get it down to four T gates. So that's a big saving. And then that's great, that's good news, but then it's also a bit worrying. How do we know that there isn't some clever scheme that uses more ancillas or measurements and that we can do a Toffley with three gates or two T gates or one T gate? So to put us out of our misery, we apply the resource theory of magic and we find that the robustness of Toffley is sandwiched between three and four T gates. So four T gates is the minimum possible that we could do, even ancilla assisted and so on. So that's good. And 
I've cut off at the bottom here, but in our uh, paper we have supplementary material and appendices that show lots of different uh, optimality or non-optimality of kind of circuits like this. Okay, so that was the second application. The third application is what I'm claiming are kind of surprising circuit identities. So this is equivalent to the Toffee, this is control, control Z. So for the same reason as before, we know that the unitary synthesis cost over the Clifford plus T set of this gate is seven. We also know using the Amy Mosca type stuff that uh, Earl talked about that we can simulate or we can synthesize this uh, cascaded control S's using four T gates. So these things can't be Clifford equivalent, obviously. But if you just look at the resource states associated with these gates, these actually are Clifford equivalent. So, um, you know, that's a little bit surprising. And so that gives you a new way of implementing the Toffley gate with four T gates. You just uh, synthesize the state rather than the unitary. And then you do this generalized uh, injection that Earl talked about. And you know, we knew to look for a Clifford that would take you from here to here because the robustness of these two things is the same. So this, uh, this example actually generalizes. So this is the tough hash that Earl discussed. And here we have cascaded control S's. And for exactly the same reason, you see that uh, T cost of this thing is 11, the T cost of this thing is 8, but when you look at the resource states, they have the same robustness, and then you can actually find an explicit Clifford that takes you from one to the other. So that gives you a way of implementing this unitary using 8 instead of 11. Here's another one that's a little bit surprising. Um, this takes T cost 6 to implement, this takes T cost 5. The only difference is this one has an extra T gate up here that's, not miss that's missing there, but the resource states are Clifford equivalent. So we kind of, uh, we can implement this using just five T gates. So we're getting this, this guy up here for free. Final example, I said before that the control control Z costs seven unit for synthesizing unitarily. For here on the right, we have controlled E, where E is a Clifford gate, which is the one that maps uh, poly X to Y, Y to Z, and cyclically. And so it's the one that uh, has this uh, state that comes out through the face of the octahedron as a fixed point, which uh, the original Bravi Katai of these were called T states, but we're trying to undo history now, and the new T states are what me and Earl are talking about. They used to be called H states. But anyway, these two things obviously aren't uh, uh, Clifford equivalent because they have different T costs. But you can create the resource state. So this is effectively the Jamilkowski state associated with the, the control E operation here. Um, these two things are Clifford equivalent. And uh, this is kind of even a bit more surprising than the other ones because this one isn't in the third level of the Clifford hierarchy. OK, so in summary, protecting qubits from errors incurs an overhead. And you said, in some sense, the Clifford stuff is easy. The T gates are costly. And so naturally, we have this resource theory picture. And we have the three applications of this resource theory. So simulating quantum circuits, explicit simulation schemes that had uh, overhead that wasn't too bad. Um, looking at optimality of circuit synthesis using robustness. And then this, uh, what I said is kind of surprising, Clifford equivalence of magic states. So unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to mention all the other really good work in this area. So there's uh, Bravi Smith and Smolin, which I did mention is Bravi Gossett. There's work by uh, Steve Bartlett's uh, group, and there's work by uh, the group in IQC as well, all on similar topics here. Um, and the, uh, the norm minimization approach, so this kind of AX equals B type uh, framework, actually encompasses um, most of these frameworks as well. So you just tweak it by saying, okay, we're trying to minimize a different norm or we're gonna kind of state the problem slightly differently. So for uh, Bravi, Smith, and Smolin, they are doing the same kind of minimization, but now they're minimizing the L0 norm because the, uh, the Schmidt rank is the number of stabilizer states that have non-zero support. And then for QDITs, the 
discrete uh, Wigner function. Um, and the resource theory associated with that is very successful. And it turns out that that fits in this scheme, scheme as well. But now the, uh, the vertices of your free region are these uh, phase point operators. And so uh, this free region is actually the Wigner polytope instead of the stabilizer polytope. And so what was known as some negativity in their uh, resource theory paper is actually just the same as robustness. OK, so all these uh, results can be understood this way. So a few open questions. So I said we ran into this uh, super exponential kind of roadblock in uh, scaling up our, our calculations. Uh, so is there some scalable way of calculating a magic resource? Um, I think that would be really useful. I'm not, I'm not sure how you'd go about that just yet. Is a measure that combines different quantifiers possible or even preferable? So the Bravi, Smith, Smolin, kind of Schmidt rank approach, that seemed to um, find that T states were kind of amongst the cheapest of the pure non stabilizer states, whereas we find them kind of quite expensive within our robustness picture. So, you know, different quantifiers. They give you different answers for what's expensive and what's not. Is there some you know, uh, way of comparing these things that means we should choose one over the other? Maybe ultimately it's what gives us the best simulation scheme. Um, you know, resource theories in other fields like entanglement, they have like results on asymptotic interconvertibility and stuff like that. Um, can we establish similar results here? And then finally, just uh, this relates to these kind of surprising uh, circuit identities. Um, a lot of work, very good work, has been put into uh, the unitary synthesis over the Clifford plus T basis. But you know, I said that actually making the state, the resource state, can cost a lot fewer T states than synthesizing the unitary itself. So can we take some of this machinery and just look and say, uh, calculate uh, get some algorithm for calculating the T cost for creating these ancillas, which would be less than the uh, the unitary synthesis cost. Um, okay, so that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. So we have time for some questions. There's a question back there. Hi. Um, how does this research? Uh, Compared to, say, the relative entropy from the stabilizer polytope, if, we, if you were to just give me an arbitrary state and ask for the relative entropy from the polytope? Yeah, so um, a lot of these resource theory um, type works, you want to have uh, um, a quantifier that's, that's well behaved. And so robustness is one that appears in a lot of um, and appears in a lot of papers, and relative entropy to the set of, or yeah, the distance, some distance type measure to the set of free states is there as well. So we went for robustness purely because of the ease of calculation. It's known that things like relative entropy, et cetera, will you know, obey all these uh, good properties that you want. But in terms of calculation, I couldn't see that um, you know, scaling as well or, or getting the same answers. But so. In terms of numbers, I don't know how they compare. Uh, I can see why you would use that in a kind of maybe more, um, you know, in a setting where you weren't interested on just doing numerics, you wanted to prove things analytically, maybe you'd prefer this, uh, this quantifier that you're talking about. We have a question back there. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask for the single qubit case. Uh, what are all the um, what are all the states that maximize your measure of robustness, and um, do they all belong to a single Clifford group, a, a single uh, a single orbit of the, under the Clifford group? So this is the state that's maximally robust amongst all single qubit states. So it used to be called the T state in the old um, notation. Let's come up with some new. Let's call it the E state anymore. Um, but yeah, that's the one that's most robust. There's a question by Sergey. Uh, 
Uh, I'm curious if you try to compute robustness for noisy magic states and try to apply your algorithm to simulate no noisy quantum circuits. Um, the short answer is no, we didn't. Um, I think, uh, if, depending on, like, if you had a very simple noise model of just pure depolarizing, I think it would be quite simple to uh, to figure that out. I think it would be a fairly simple, uh, you know, correction to the to the robustness uh, that we've calculated already. Thanks. Hey, so did you say that? I guess the robustness ends up being the same as the subnegativity from the Wigner function resource theory? Exactly, yeah. OK, so is there a good, an easy reason to see why maybe these results would have been harder to come by using that resource theory, with, which has the same measure? Sorry. Can we... Well, so if, the, if both the resource theories have the same, same resource measure, um, would these results that you have have been as easy to come by and, and see and get using just the, the Wigner function picture rather than well, right, so the, the, the Wigner function works for qubits, right, and ah. so that's, okay. a, yeah, I think you know that. <laughs> right, 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 because, okay. Um, yeah, so, you know, you have these uh, funny properties of uh, prime dimensions that all primes are odd except two, which is the oddest of all. So, if, you know, when you <laughs> run with that, it turns out that Wigner functions for multi-qubit systems are incredibly tricky and... Uh, complicated to work with, whereas for qubits, prime or power of prime dimension where the prime is odd, uh, it's very well behaved. And uh, yeah, so the, robust, the robustness there becomes the sum of the negative entries in your discrete Wigner function, and that's, your, that's a well-behaved uh, uh, monotone. All right, thanks. So there's another question here. Yeah. Hi. So, have you looked at these circuits that are simulable when you have low, robust, low robustness? Whether they are, whether they admit non-contextual hidden variable models? Um, so, I mean, even if we, even if we just restricted ourselves to stabilizers states. They don't have non-contextual hidden variable models, right? So if you have states with small amounts of robustness, they could just be, they would be, by definition, just kind of epsilon outside the stabilizer polytope. So you know, if your original um, scenario with just stabilizer stuff is ha doesn't have a non-contextual hidden variable model, I don't see why the, the nearby state that has you know, uh, some of the resource in it would be either. I think Robert had a question. So uh, I'm interested in this connection with the world of Wigner functions. So let's talk about qubits, say Q trits. So I thought in David Gross's PhD thesis, there's an example. Uh, of a state with a positive Wigner function that is not a probabilistic combination of stabilizer states. <coughs> so it seems that if you work in this Wigner function picture, more states are genuinely classical than in the stabilizer picture. Um, so my question is, have you looked at, say, Qtrit specifically and have computed the magic or your, your robustness um, within the stabilizer reference or with respect to um, Wigner functions? So it, are there more efficient simulation techniques based on Wigner functions if you apply your measure? So the... the uh the resource theory in full for the Wigner function scenario is already done by, you know, Emerson and Co. Um, but they they didn't apply it specifically to this question of simulation. If that's what you're talking about. So is their simulation for Qtrit say is their simulation more efficient? 
More efficient than what? Than yours, if you would apply yours to Qtrits. Well, so I'm saying, I mean, you, you have the choice whether you want to, you can, you can choose the set of free stuff. So if you choose the set of free stuff to be the stuff that's inside the Wigner polytope, then you get exactly the resource theory that Veach and Emerson and so on have. Yeah. And how that scales for classical simulation of some Clifford plus generalized T circuit, I don't know. I, okay. They didn't do that. I didn't do that. Um, yeah. Okay, I'll use my privilege as a chair to ask the last question. So, um, in the simulation, uh, I was wondering, don't you need to compute the vector x to perform the simulation? And can you do that efficiently? So that was this uh, thing I had about chunking it into, uh, so we have tau, tau copies of this t state. Yes. But I said I'm going to break that down into chunks of five each. Oh, I see. And that's how we get that 1.685 scaling. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you again. And uh, here's your QIP t-shirt. Yeah. So let's thank Mark. <laughs>